If a friendly alien from outer space were to visit just one country on Earth, to what land would we steer him for the best showcase of our accomplishments? Who would be the most likely to roll out the Benvenuto mat, regale him with song, fill him with pasta, and then try to marry him off to a first cousin from Brindisi? What soil has most nurtured Western civilization? Whose marble has been shaped into Western art? Now that friendly alien will see the accomplishments of centuries spill through an hourglass. Italy is the best of everything this planet can offer. Oh, there are lands where life is more orderly, but none where life is more fun. This land, the keeper of over 40% of all the world's art treasures, is itself a living museum. From the snow-swept Alps to sun-drenched Sicily, this land is more than a nation. It's a civilization. Italian energy bursts through more than marble and paint. It's crackling at early morning and still simmering in nighttime sidewalk cafes. Italians are highly vocal. When they're not singing, they're talking. Talk doesn't just happen, it erupts. Italians talk with their hands. In Italy, to have one's hands tied behind one's back is to be virtually speechless. Ask any Italian, and he'll tell you that nowhere on earth can you live so well. No city so beautiful. No climate so agreeable. No food so tasty. No beaches so inviting. No men so virile. Or women so lovely. Ask any Italian. Or one of the 40 million visitors who come here every year. Italy, a jagged peninsula shaped like a boot, to the north, Switzerland and Austria, France to the northwest, and the Dalmatian coast across the Adriatic to the east. Italy's toe points to the island of Sicily. The heel rests in the Adriatic, and the Apennine Mountains weave along the country like the cross-lacing of a Roman boot. A land whose 58 million Italians welcome us. To Naples, birthplace of Caruso and thin crust pizza. Volcanic Sicily, Bologna, in a nation of superb cooks, the culinary capital. Verona, hometown to Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Unique, splendiferous Venice, where everyone travels by boat, even lovers. Smart, chic, trendy. That's Milan, the design capital of Italy. On a spectacular stretch of seafront, the Italian Riviera. Florence, a trove of Renaissance treasure and Florentine chic. The seven hills of Rome and the ruins of an ancient empire amid dizzy whirls of traffic. This is the capital of a land studded with capitals. This is Italy. Italy has a long, stony history. Unmistakable relics peer out from everywhere. Here, it was the mysterious Etruscans who first hammered out a civilization. It was the Etruscans who cut the building blocks for a Roman Republic. Romans, reinventing the face of the earth. They fought and they conquered. Built far-flung roads which led to a city that became an empire. For a thousand years, the Romans characterized humankind at its best. And its worst. When Rome fell, 
Italy became a peninsular free-for-all. Swarms of invaders came to conquer. Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Lombards, Germans. Italy lay in darkness. From the Dark Ages into the Middle Ages, Europe withdrew from the world. This was an era of the hereafter. Earthly existence was no more than a prelude to life after death. In Europe, classical learning lay in a long sleep. But in the 15th century came a reawakening, and Italy reached out like streams of light to awaken the rest of Europe. Into a Gothic gloom came new perspectives in art, literature, and science. Sheer genius soared through the Italian skies like comets. Ideas that launched discoveries, founded modern medicine. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Galileo. But Renaissance Italy was still a patchwork of feuding states. Tuscany, Lombardy, Veneto. Then, in the early 1800s, a freedom fighter arose who led the fragmented Italian people to nationhood. Giuseppe Garibaldi, Italia Risorgimento. Italy, rise again. At last, the Italians were united under one flag. The seething patchwork became a single quilt. Today, Italians admit that there are really two Italys, North and South. The North at the forefront of European culture and industry. Magnificent Florence, extraordinary Venice, thriving Milan, familiar, inviting. It is from the bustling North that Italian excellence is exported. Art, high fashion, high technology. But the sunny South is a world away. A land once the realm of knights from Normandy, Moors from North Africa. It is here, in the heart of what Italians call a mezzogiorno, land of the midday sun, we find Salerno, Capri, the ruins of Pompeii, the uplift of Naples. And it is here that we begin our journey, in a place called Neapolis by the Greeks who settled here in the 6th century BC. Less than 150 miles south of Rome, lies Naples, in the province of Campania, a land drenched in light and heat. All that the outsider thinks of as Italy is found here. The songs, the smells, and the sights. See Naples and die, they shout. The city clings to hilly, volcanic outcrops over grottos and catacombs of hardened lava, facing a shimmering waterfront. Naples abounds with places to see. The beautiful Galleria Umberto with its high glass ceiling and mosaic-covered floors. It's a spectacular arena for a shopping spree. The Church of St. Francis of Paola is modeled after Rome's Pantheon. and the 13th century Castel Nuovo is still the political hub of the city. Oh, visitors are always welcome to Naples with open arms, and it seems that everyone has a cousin in New York or San Francisco. Vibrant Naples, a song of a city with everything in Within a single day, Neapolitans act out a lifetime of emotions. They laugh, cry, and embrace, sometimes even insult one another. A genius for living through the senses. In Naples, everybody sings, and many aspire to perform at the great opera house Teatro San Carlo. Back in 1873, a boy was born into a poor family. From babyhood, singing came naturally to him. 
His lyric tenor was so beautiful, his depth of feeling so great, that young men would pay him to serenade their girlfriends. That boy was Enrico Caruso. He thrilled audiences in the great opera houses of Europe and in the Metropolitan in New York. Caruso became the most famous opera singer the world has ever known. The former slum kid from Naples commanded huge sums, but he worked for them. Though he retained his Italian citizenship, he preferred to sing in the U.S. He was 45 when he married, and his bride was American, 25-year-old Dorothy Benjamin of an old New England family. By 1920, this great artist had pushed himself too far. He grew weak during a performance, and on August 2nd, 1921, he died of bronchial pneumonia. He was 48. The entire world mourned. Even today, the highest compliment you can pay an Italian or American tenor is, you sing like Caruso. Pompeii. Just 10 miles south of Naples in the shadow of mighty Mount Vesuvius. It was once a luxurious body resort where Romans could get away from the teeming capital. Then, on August 24th, 79 AD, Vesuvius erupted. Pompeii, Herculaneum, doom. Men, women, and children fled through the streets, tumbling over one another. For 11 hours, Vesuvius raged. When finally it subsided, Pompeii lay buried under tons of pumice and ash. 1,700 years after the tragedy, mud and lava, now hard as concrete, were broken through. discoveries were startling and frightening. People, human beings at daily tasks, suddenly stopped and frozen in time. Family homes, gardens, murals perfectly preserved. Reminders of a world as it was 2,000 years ago. Walking these streets today is the closest we may come to time travel. Vesuvius is quiet now. People have returned to live on its slopes. The thoughts of when it will erupt again flicker occasionally, only to be set aside to be thought about tomorrow. The Amalfi Drive breathtakingly beautiful, with a touch of danger. The Amalfi Peninsula is ribboned with the most thrilling scenic drive in Europe, perhaps in the world. A blissful mating of sea and sky, hills sloping into the Mediterranean, fishing towns, and you can follow the road to the place that inspired the most beloved of all Italian songs, Sorrento. An island skirts Sorrento that itself has inspired a musical tribute, the Isle of Capri. A place where the jet set unwinds.
jagged coast, bays, coves, once hideaways for pirates. And here, the Blue Grotto, a wonder of sapphire blue. Ancient Romans made a playground of Capri. Here, old Emperor Tiberius built villas. And here, he'd indulge in unusual after-dinner entertainment, flinging those he suspected of disloyalty to their death over these cliffs. To the east of Capri lies the Bay of Salerno. Salerno. The American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was taken with it. He wrote, the blue Salernian bay with its sickle of white sand. American GIs in 1943 didn't quite see it this way. In 1943, the continent was Hitler's, his impregnable fortress Europe. It was 3.30 in the morning on September 9th. Troops landed at Salerno, 70,000 of them. German artillery was sighted in the surrounding mountains, trained on the invaders. The 16th Panzer Division was thrown against the Allies, and they were raked by enemy fire. The enemy held. Then reinforcements arrived. 1,300 American paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne helped turn the tide. But Hitler's fortress had been broken at Salerno. The next Allied initiative was the liberation of Naples, and then a northward thrust to Anzio. But Salerno cost the Americans 3,500 lives. They joined the thousands of GIs who never left Italy. They rest here, in hero cemeteries that hallow Italian soil. In eons past, it was all one landmass. But in historic times, Sicily finds itself cropped from the Italian mainland and duly separated by the Strait of Messina. Mighty Mount Etna erupts sporadically within a decade or a century, shaping and reshaping the island's terrain. Like these lava fields, Sicilians themselves are volcanic, smoldering, independent, explosive. The Sicilian way of life throbs to ancient rhythms. Rhythms as timeless as the black shawl subduing its matriarchal women. Machismo. Family. Faith. Values for a people marching to the beat of their own drum an afternoon of espresso, and braggadocio with the cronies, a night of wedding cake and promises. Like a Sicilian wedding cake, Sicilian culture comes in layers. Take Syracuse. Long before the Romans made a province of this island, and before the Arabs invaded, or the Normans or the French, ancient Greeks built this city, Syracusa by the sea. In this theater, Greek actors performed their classic tragedies and comedies. Oh, Sicily has seen it all. Sicily has been ever proud, but often poor. And so Sicilians joined other Southerners in the mass migrations from Italy to America. Some families lost more than half their children to emigration. But each brought something of the homeland with them. Customs, style, cuisine. Sicilians joined other Southern Italians in whetting a worldwide appetite for Italian food. Italians from north and south represent two points of the Italian compass. There's a notion that most southerners typified by Sicilians are shorter, closer to the earth, composed of Mediterranean muscle and dark-eyed sultriness. 
while northerners are of a haughty height and often fair. Whether from north or south, it isn't how an Italian looks, but how he looks at life. The citizens of Bologna in the Emilia-Romagna are somewhat typical of the northern Italians. Emilia-Romagna is a crossroad province of north-central Italy that stretches to the Adriatic Sea. Its capital is a splendid old city. Bologna, a panorama of marbled sidewalks, porticos, and the oldest university in all of Europe. Petrarch studied here, so did Copernicus. And it was here that Marconi, who gave radio to the world, worked out many of his inventions. They started building St. Petronius in 1390. Construction is still going on. Nestling in farm country, Bologna is considered to have the best cooks in a nation of superb cooks. In family appearances, Papa is all. But in reality, it is the Mama who rules, through the heart and through the stomach. Visiting the province of Veneto is like raising the curtain on the panorama of plays by Shakespeare. Padua, where Petruccio found his shrew. I've come to wive it wealthily in Padua. The merchant of Venice. The quality of mercy is not strained. It brought... And of course, Verona. Verona, filled with monuments, medieval, Roman still piercing the sky. The old arena is still buzzing. Concerts, operas, plays. But Verona is best known as the city of Shakespeare's lovers, Romeo and Juliet. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny where civil blood makes civil hands unclean, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? No one forgets the youthful passion underlying this tragedy. Today, the Verona post office gets thousands of letters addressed to Juliet, Verona, or Romeo, Verona. For never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. Venice, more than a city, it's a state of mind. To some, a recurring dream of water and music touched with melancholy. Venice is a world unto itself. Venice, an empire on water. Every year in May, in its annual Regatta Storica, Venetians celebrate the grandeur of their past. When Venice was a world financial powerhouse, when the power of the Republic of Venice resounded throughout the Mediterranean and the Middle East. When the doges, here reenacted on a replica of the state barge, were elected heads of this imperial city. When the Venetian fleet sailed into these waters with cargoes of silk, spices, and jewels. Today, behind this tapestry of Venice's past, the same vibrant, energetic Venetians, as practical as they are poetic. 118 islands moored in a glittering bay. Four hundred bridges 
some with patterns as intricate as hand-woven lace. Narrow canals spring like tributaries from that magnificent waterway, the Grand Canal. Canals are a joyous procession of gondolas bearing the robust, the fiery. Any moment a gondolier will break into song. San Marco Square, St. Mark's, the hub of the city. Crowned by the five-domed cathedral where the doges heard mass. Amid exotic mosaics and sculpture from Greece, Syria, and Africa. The gold altarpiece encases the remains of Venice's patron, St. Mark, who wrote the second gospel. It sparkles with thousands of emeralds, sapphires, rubies, diamonds, and everywhere, gold. At the top of the square stands the Doge's Palace, with displays of Venetian grandeur, from ceilings to marble floors. The prison adjoining the palace is a reminder of the grim side of power. Casanova, that notorious womanizer, was imprisoned here for practicing black magic. Like all prisoners, he crossed this tiny bridge sighing for those last moments of freedom. So it's called the Bridge of Sighs. But leave it to the Venetians. Kiss your lover beneath these arches, they say, and your love will last forever. The 16th century Rialto Bridge, a setting for Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, is lined with shops and stalls stocked with leather goods, Venetian glass, and the delicate lace of Burano. Every place in Italy boasts an opera house, but only Venice has Teatro La Fenice, over four centuries old. In 1851, Giuseppe Verdi, whose operas were wildly popular, was to premiere his latest work, Rigoletto, at Venice's La Fenice. He had composed a tenor aria that today we'd call a showstopper, La Donna e Mobile. And he didn't want every gondolier on the canal singing it before the opera's opening night. So rehearsals were closed to outsiders, shut off. Even the tenor who was to sing it didn't get the score until the last minute. Opening night was a staggering success. Audiences left the opera house humming La Donna e Mobile up and down the canals, and a whole fleet of gondoliers could be heard warbling the aria throughout the city. But it was after the opening. Even today, if you can't attend the opera inside, you'll get a performance from the gondoliers outside. How soothing this beautiful city is with its quiet, noise-free waterways. The last Italian city where strolling and dreaming can be done in peace. No buses, no cars, no rickshaws, no bicycles. By foot, by boat, or not at all. Only in Venice. Here, at the city's famed carnival, Venice takes in the world from turbans to feather bonnets, the opulent, the laughing, and the laughable. A round dance of pre-Lenten revelry. Yes, Venice is a celebration of Venice. Lombardia, Lombardy. 
The Po Valley and its timeless agriculture. And Milan, projecting itself energetically into the 21st century. The Lake District, a region bewitching in its beauty, rising to spectacular alpine heights. The Italian Alps, their rugged peaks creating a primitive landscape and a haven for sports lovers. Scaling these rocky cliffs can be enjoyed only by those who are trained for it. But anyone can enjoy the shimmering blue of Lake Como with its breathtaking scenery, its sumptuous 16th century villas, now ranked among Europe's most elegant hotels. The little city of Como is a silk capital. The silk industry here works closely with fashion design houses in Milan. Just 30 miles away from this serene countryside bustles the industrial and financial capital of Italy, Milano, Milan. A fashion capital, publishing, television, manufacturing, Italy's stock exchange, chic, vibrant. This is Milan. The seeds that sprouted this modern metropolis were planted four centuries ago during the Renaissance by one of the most remarkable men who ever lived. Born out of wedlock in the village of Vinci, Leonardo was an artist, inventor, engineer, architect, who made notes of his ideas in handwriting that could be read only in mirrors to escape the ridicule of those who couldn't understand him. At last he found acceptance in Milan by the rulers of Lombardy, and it was here more than anywhere else that the fullness of his genius shone forth. For Milan, he created works beyond his time, into centuries yet to come, in engineering, inventions, his astonishing flying machine, and the most famous portrait ever painted, the Mona Lisa. Milano's Church of St. Mary of the Graces houses another world-famous Leonardo painting, the Last Supper. Leonardo is a comet in the sky of human history. Piazza Duomo is Milano's center, crowned by its cathedral. Begun in 1386, it took 500 years to complete the largest Gothic structure in Italy, a lacework of marble with a gold Madonna atop the tallest spire. There are 135 spires in all and 2,245 statues adorning the exterior. It's been called a dream in stone. Nearby, the Galleria, the world's first shopping mall. Since 1877, a gathering place for the lively set. Others aside from Leonardo made an imprint on Milan. In the 20s and 30s, it was Benito, Benito Mussolini. It was Milan that first voted Mussolini into power. His voice resounded over these streets. If I advance, follow me. If I retreat, kill me. Near the end of World War II, Mussolini did retreat to Milan, and they killed him. Today, those same streets are no longer emblazoned by the leader of fascism. Instead, they are signatured by Gucci, Armani, Fendi, the leaders in fashion. The northwestern coast of Italy boasts not only Genoa, a city that's famous as Columbus's birthplace, and for a pasta sauce called pesto, but it's embraced by one of the world's most luxurious stretches of sand and sea, the Riviera. The Riviera is international, crossing some of the world's most fabulous resort areas. It starts in the south of France, continuing through Cannes, Nice, until France's Riviera melts into Italy at Monton. There the Italian Riviera begins. 
It's a coastal haven of sun and sea. Welcoming, inviting, unforgettably beautiful. Portofino is the smallest, but the most celebrated resort on Italy's Riviera. An exquisite horseshoe harbor fronts small restaurants, boutiques, cafes. Once there were only fishing boats docked in this narrow inlet. Now luxury yachts sail in from all over the world, while the smart set looks on and is looked at. To the west, toward France, lie the whispered treasures of the Italian Riviera, places with names that roll off the tongue like Ventimiglia, Porto Venere, Bordeghera, the kinds of villages dreams are made on. The village rises from the sea like a wise old woman scarred by the winds of time. Sleepy and peaceful, with narrow cobbled alleyways, and fishing boats bobbing in the harbor. These vessels belong to the fishermen whose great love, whose true love, is the sea. Their joy for living is apparent in their laughter and their songs. And here, beyond the crowd, resides the true spirit of Italy. Ancient, beautiful, Mediterranean port metropolis, that's Genoa. Once known as La Superba, one of Italy's most important cities. Transatlantic liners from New York bound for Italy docked here in Genoa's harbor. Until transatlantic jets to Rome and Milan took over. In times past, Genoa was a republic and a great maritime power. When her seafarers sailed the uncharted oceans, they shattered forever the old notions of geography. Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa. The family house still stands. His name is listed in the city registry. A man forever destined to be one of Italy's most famous sons. Toscana, Tuscany an Italian province that was once the soil tilled by the Etruscans in their growing civilization. Now, with its trio of Renaissance cities, Pisa, Siena, Florence, it is one of the most visited regions in Italy. The hills of Tuscany bear a name that reaches the world over to lovers of Italian food, Chianti. In these vineyards, the grapes are cultivated then pressed into that most popular of Italian wines. Often bottled in a straw wickering, which in other countries at least, is a Chianti trademark. For connoisseurs, there is Chianti Classico. But for the multitude, Chianti is the wine that goes best with spaghetti. Serenely, peacefully, flows the River Arno, bisecting one of the most remarkable cities in the history of humankind. Firenze, Florence. Of the eight bridges spanning this river, the most ancient is the Ponte Vecchio, the old bridge. Florence, a glow in the warm Tuscan earth, a living presence is felt in every nook and corner of this wondrous city. In a single century, a mere blinking of an eye in the march of human progress. Some of the greatest achievements in the world sprang to life here. Florence is unmistakably Renaissance. And Renaissance Florentines trod these narrow lanes, stood beneath these archways, planning, arguing, changing the world. Dante of the Divine Comedy, Boccaccio of the Decameron, Machiavelli. Here in the Piazza della Signoria, the city fathers vied for the services of architects, sculptors, and painters, who were as sought after in 15th century Florence as star athletes are today. From this piazza, Benvenuto Cellini. From these palaces, Raphael, 
from these tombs, Michelangelo. Looking out onto the Piazza della Signoria is the Uffizi, its galleries housing one of the great art collections of this world. Canvases are arranged in historical periods of Italian art, primitives to portraits. Art lovers come here to view Botticelli's Birth of Venus as though visiting a shrine. In city planning, the Florentine byword was più bello che si più, as beautiful as possible. When Michelangelo first saw these baptistry doors, he exclaimed, the gates of paradise. Indeed, these were designed and executed by Lorenzo Ghiberti, who was just 20 years old when he beat out his nearest rival, named Brunelleschi, for the permission to do them. Ghiberti worked 20 years to create this bronze epic of the Bible and it took him another 22 years to bring this second set of doors into being. Meanwhile, his rival, Filippo Brunelleschi, accepted a commission across the street from the baptistry, a dome for the city's cathedral. His plans were met with skepticism, technically impossible, but 14 years later, his dome was completed. It was a sensation. Today, as then, it crowns the Cathedral of Santa Maria dei Fiori, Holy Mary of the Flowers. But one work overshadows all others. It stands in the gallery of the Academy, Michelangelo's David. The American writer Irving Stone believed that Michelangelo strove to create a David who would be Apollo, but more, Hercules, but more, an Adam, but more. He created this, a Titan. The most fully realized man the world had yet seen, or has seen since. The city of Siena, Florence's neighbor, is storybook Middle Ages. A sun-bleached setting for pageants and processions like the Palio della Contrade. This is a horse race run so earnestly, a race arousing such passions in the city's population that even the mounts are given a blessing. Twice a year, this historic race sets Siena ablaze. Before the main event, costumes and banners swirl in a flag-throwing ceremony. Each bareback riding jockey represents one of the wards into which the city is divided. The colors are dazzling. Running the race requires tremendous skill from the riders. The victor becomes the season's hero whether or not he manages to stay on the horse. First prize is a prestigious heraldic banner. Victors bask in glory and the city erupts into celebration. Few buildings are as eye-catching as the Leaning Tower of Pisa, probably the most recognizable monument in the Western world. The eight-story bell tower has always been shrouded in legend. Construction began in 1174. They say Bonanno, the architect, deliberately intended the tower to lean. If the tower stood straight, it would measure 180 feet. Another story has it that Galileo, the father of modern science and a native Pisan, climbed regularly the 294 steps to the top of the tower. He'd drop objects of different weights and time their descent to prove his theories on bodies in motion. Lazio, the province of Latium, once an ancient country, is a bridge between north and south. Ostia is its port, Tivoli its playground, and its capital, Italy's capital, is the city that all roads lead to, Rome.
To some, Rome is la dolce vita, the sweet life, the rosy life. But to most of us, it is the eternal city. Every cobblestone, every brick within Rome's massive walls speaks of history, and what a history. They say Rome is one place a person is never alone. Spirits linger everywhere, spirits of ancient civilizations. Of Romulus and Remus, the city's legendary founders, for 500 years, the Romans were conquerors, giants in commerce and administration, creating a civilization more advanced than any of the ancient world. Imagine the power that brought these into being. The Forum, the city's religious and political hub. Splendid temples, basilicas once stood on this ground. Everywhere, Romans built roads, bridges, aqueducts, and public baths, luxurious baths like the Baths of Caracalla, whose ruins still show traces of former splendor. During the Republic, the Roman Senate vied for power with generals. One such general was Julius Caesar, brilliant and wildly popular with the people. Caesar was declared Rome's ruler for life. His was a life to be cut short. On the 15th of March, 44 BC, Caesar was assassinated in the Forum. Rome plunged into civil war. Now it was Caesar's nephew who emerged victorious. Power stayed in the family. In 27 BC, he became Caesar Augustus, the first of the Roman emperors. He claimed to have found Rome a city of brick and left it a city of marble. Augustus commissioned the Pantheon as a monument to the gods. It's still the best preserved of all Roman buildings. Huge marble columns support a perfectly proportioned dome. An astounding structure. In 117 AD, the Emperor Hadrian escaped the turmoil of the city to his pleasure garden just 30 miles away in a village called Tivoli. The Romans created a world in their own image and what a splendid image. Rome is the eternal city, the heart of civilization. But for today's Romans, it's a grand stage for the human comedy Italian style, a playground. It's splendid monuments anchoring dizzy whirls of traffic. Rome's welcome is a warm smile of sights and sounds. The Trevi Fountain draws visitors to its waters like a magnet. It's become world famous as a wishing well since the 50s film Three Coins in a Fountain. Romans say, toss a coin over your shoulder and you're sure to come back to Rome. Generations of Romans have hawked their wares at the early morning Campo dei Fiori market. Centuries have come and gone, but the setting remains the same in the Rome of the Renaissance. Bernini's Four Rivers Fountain in the elegant Piazza Navona.
Here on Capitoline Hill, Michelangelo designed this elegant square, the Campidoglio, a bridge between ancient Rome and the Renaissance. Rome is a city of treasures and pleasures. The simple ones are free. All you need are eyes and ears and a quality of spirit to discover them. When in Rome, do as the Romans do and enjoy an espresso under the arcades of the Piazza Colonna, facing the Marcus Aurelius Column. In the city's very heart, the Spanish Steps. A meeting place for friends, a trysting place for lovers, a resting place for backpackers, and a spectacle for gawkers. Nearby, the Via Condotti glitters with Italian panache and style. Once Rome's atmosphere is vibrantly modern, but unmistakably eternal. Strolling these ancient streets, one cannot forget that Rome is not only the capital of Italy, but was once the capital of the world, and that Rome holds the secrets of the most important events in the history of man. It was in the Emperor Tiberius's reign that in the remote province of Palestine, an itinerant teacher named Jesus was crucified under Roman law. His followers were condemned throughout the empire, yet one of them risked his life to bring the message of Jesus to Rome. He was apprehended on a charge of treason and thrown into this prison, and here, at Tre Fontane, beheaded. That apostle was St. Paul, whose basilica known as St. Paul's Outside the Walls was built over his tomb. The message of Jesus spread. The number of Christians increased, but because they refused to acknowledge the emperors as gods, they were driven underground. This fish symbol was the secret sign of recognition among Christians. When caught, they were dealt with as traitors. The history of the Colosseum is a gruesome one. On its grand opening, 50,000 spectators were entertained by the slaughter of 5,000 beasts in this wooden floored arena. Yes, Romans loved the spectacle. As for Christians, men, women, and children were driven through these underground corridors into the glare of the arena. To be mauled by lions and gored by bulls. What remained of these martyrs was taken through lower corridors of the Colosseum into catacombs. Here, Christians met to worship and to commemorate their dead. Then in 315 AD, the Emperor Constantine, it is told, saw a vision. His legions were marching to victory under a banner that wasn't Roman. Rather, it was a cross. And he heard the words, in hoc signo vinces, under this sign you shall conquer. He did. Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. For almost a thousand years, Rome had dominated the Western world. Collapse was inevitable. Yet the legacy of Rome is very much with us today. In Europe, we still travel Roman roads and cross Roman bridges. Throughout the world, we observe Roman legal codes. 
Roman Latin is the language of our sciences. Roman vaulting has long been a part of our architecture. Our debt to Rome is overwhelming. This is a sovereign state, the tiniest in the world, a city within a city ringed in stone that locks its gates every night, the Vatican. Vatican City is crowned by the largest dome in Christendom, St. Peter's, which rises over this great piazza. It collects no income taxes from its 400 citizens, holds no general elections, and submits in secular as well as spiritual matters to the Bishop of Rome, affectionately referred to in Italy as Il Papa, the Pope. These are the elite Swiss guards who dedicate their lives to serving the Pope. They say their costumes were designed by Michelangelo. A private audience with the Pope is a sought after honor, even by the rich and famous. And thousands in St. Peter's Square regularly await the papal blessing. Almost 2,000 years ago, in this same square, ancient Romans ran chariot races. Nearby, during one of Rome's roundups of outlawed Christians, an elderly Galilean fisherman was picked up. They crucified him, it is said, upside down, because he protested that he was unworthy to be nailed upright on a cross as his Lord had been. That fisherman was the Apostle Peter, who had been the first bishop of Rome. Now his grave lies beneath this great dome. Throughout the centuries, pilgrims have paid homage to Peter by kissing the foot of this early bronze likeness. Their devotion has worn the foot smooth. This great dome was designed by Michelangelo, whose genius is stamped elsewhere in Vatican City. Just inside the entrance of the great St. Peter's Basilica is La Pietà. Michelangelo was only 25 years old when he completed this masterpiece. It is the only work that he ever signed. Here, Mary is every mother who has ever lost her son. Michelangelo could work miracles in marble, but his Pope, Julius II, a demanding, forceful man, challenged him to work the same miracles in paint. But my craft is stone. But he submitted. For four years of agony, he lay on his back painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The outcome was superb. He transformed the ceiling into images of startling power. Twenty-three years later, he returned to the Sistine Chapel to paint his vision of the Last Judgment. No other artist has rendered so terrifying a scene of human accountability to God. In the long shadow of Italy's monuments live today's Italians their glorious past empowering the present with thoughts of tomorrow. For Italy is at once an opera, a serenade, and hand talk. At once, St. Peter's, Pasta and Panache, Leonardo who invented flying machines, and Marconi who invented radio. It's the Amalfi Drive and Alpine Lakes. It's Michelangelo's David, Milan's Duomo, and Mamma Mia's kitchen. It's ancient ruins amid a roar of traffic, and a history so long, so rooted in misty antiquity, a land so fragmented by centuries of invasions, that it has been a people who have held Italy together. 
of people who have seen it all, whose welcoming smile says, make the most of each day's moment, of people whose true genius is their contagious love of life. Thank you.